Well, good morning, guys. Got a little bit different uh, computer setup this morning. Anyway, so you're not going to be able to see the, the scripture on the screen. But we are finishing 1 Peter. We're going to do basically the whole chapter 5. 5, uh, 1 through 14. It uh, seems like a lot, but it's not a lot of content. We'll go back and pick a few things out. So anyway, chapter 5, 1 Peter 5. So, as your fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, and as one who shares in the glory that will be revealed, I urge the elders among you, give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you, exercising oversight, not merely as a duty, but willingly under God's direction, not for shameful profit, but eagerly. And do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock. Then, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. And then in verse 5, it's a new paragraph, or, or at least in this version. It says, In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And God will exalt you in due time, if you humble yourselves under his mighty hand, by casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring, roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Resist him, strong in your faith, because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are enduring the same kind of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him belongs the power forever. Amen. Ah, but we're not done. Verse 12. Through Silvanus, whom I know to be a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly in order to encourage you and testify that this is the true grace of God, Stand fast in it. The church in Babylon, chosen together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. My son, greet one another with a loving kiss. Peace to all you are in Christ. So, the very first part is about elders. It says, so as your fellow, fellow, felder, your fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, so Peter was a witness to the sufferings, and as one who shares in the glory that will be revealed, I urge elders among you. So he's saying, look guys, I'm an elder, I've witnessed Christ's suffering, I share in the glory, I'm, I'm part of you, I'm, I'm urging the elders among you, among your church. Um, what are, What is he urging the elders to do? Well, first of all, who's an elder? Elders in the Bible can be uh, two positions. So we have uh, the pastor of a church that could be the shepherd, elder, overseer, teacher. These All these names really talk about the same position. But we also have elders in the church that maybe not the head of the church, but are also leaders in the church. New Testament churches were based on uh, multiple elder leadership in a local church. And what that means is you usually had two or three elders in the church. Not uh, not pastors. There's usually one head pastor and, and multiple leadership. So he's just saying, what are the elders' jobs? Remember we have deacons too. That's another story. But he says, give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you, exercising oversight, not merely as a duty, because you have to, but willingly under God's direction. Not for shameful profit, but eagerly. And do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock. So these are the, the characteristics of an elder. So if a church is trying to pick elders, not only do you need to go to the Timothy and Titus qualifications of elders and, and pastors and deacons, but you... You, you, we could go right here and say that a that an elder should not uh, it should have a heart to serve, not just uh, as a duty. 
and uh, should serve willingly under God's direction, not for profit. Don't lord it over those. So these are characteristics of an elder. So here at the Cowboy Church, we have a, a really a biblical uh, form of leadership. We have a pastor, that's me, and then we have elders. Those are um, chosen, picked, however you want to say it, and they should meet. The same qualify. They are the same qualifications as a pastor. They 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 aren't distinguished. They're just uh, not called to um, be the the pulpit preacher every Sunday. But they are called to basically be pastors of the church, and it's usually more than one of a local church. If you go back in the in the churches in the New Testament, there's usually more than one. And he says, I mean, here we go. Uh, I urge the elders among you. So if he's talking to one church, if this letter was written to a church, the elders among you. I mean, there's so many uh, little things like that that teach us that multiple elders. Anyway. Uh, and it tells you that the shepherd appears, you receive the crown of glory. That means the shepherd is watching. We will be, we, the elders, will be rewarded as... Um, as uh, the chief shepherd comes back. So, <clears throat> elders, and I know this doesn't apply to our daily lives very much, but elders in a church should exhibit these things. They should care for the flock, exercising oversight, not as a duty, things like that. So Peter is saying, look, I'm an elder, you're elders, I saw Christ suffering, this is the way we need to be doing it. Verse 5, in the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. He always says this in the same way. Well, in the same way, well, not everybody can act in the same way. But he's talking about being subject to the elders as the same as the elders are subject to God's direction. Now, all of you, now we're getting out of the elder section, all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So, Yes, we should uh, be subject to the elders. We should be humble to the elders. We should listen to them, not be uh, hard-headed to them, not be divisive to them. And all of you, clothe yourself with humility. Elders, too, clothe yourself with humility. Don't act like, well, I run the show. That is not how it works. Number one, you don't run a show. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And God will exalt you in due time. If... You humble yourself under his mighty hand. How? By casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. See, the humble doesn't cast their cares on anyone. They're the, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the prideful don't cast their cares on anyone, do they? They, uh, they take it all. I'm the man. I can handle it. But a humble person gives their cares. They cast their cares on God because he cares for you. I, I can't do this. I'm, I don't know what to tell you. I, I I'm, God's got to do this. Uh, many days, uh, pretty much every day, I feel that I am incapable and, and not able and not worthy to be an elder or pastor of this church. But through God only, uh, He allows me to do it. Every day, I say, I don't know what we're going to do next, especially in this crazy virus junk. I can't even go visit people in the hospital. Like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know. It's like, I have to rely on God and, and go slow, and, and that causes people to be impatient sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, well, well, I think we need to do this. We need to, we need, we need, we need. well, uh, I think we need to follow God's direction here because I don't have any good ideas. It's We have to submit ourselves to God. There is no other way. Maybe God has taken this time in our in our history to put us back in our place. See? You don't know what you're doing. You need to rely on me. Maybe he's telling us that. Verse 8. Be sober and alert. Why? What do I need to be sober and alert for? Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Oh, so I need to be sober and alert. The devil isn't taking that today. He's not taking a sabbatical. He didn't go deer hunting this Sunday. Uh-oh, my, my screen just went blank. 
he uh, he's not taking the day off, right, as we get to do. He is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Resist him, strong in your faith, because you know that brothers and sisters throughout the world are enduring the same kind of suffering. It's not just you. Don't get on that train for pitiful me. Hey, it can always get worse, I promise you. He's saying, resist him. Be strong in your faith. Get out of here. No, that's not the truth. I believe in Christ. He says I'm worthy. When he starts filling your head full of these things, you're not forgiven and, and you're unworthy and, and you don't deserve love and, and he's not going to help you. and He's not going to, oh, get out of here. I'm standing strong in my faith. Jesus says he does love me. He says I am saved. He says he wants to heal me. He wants my family to come back together. He wants to restore me. Get out of my, get out. I don't care who you are. That's resisting the devil. Let's see. Um, my screen went blank. Let me find out where we are. Verse 10. And, if you, and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Hey, can we say hallelujah, right? And after you have suffered for a little while, it's just a little while, even though sometimes it seems like a, a 20 year sentence, it's just a little while. It's just a little while. The God of all grace, not uh, your gracious friend, not the, the, not the grace of this or the grace of that, it's the God of all grace. The one that admitted it. Who called you to eternal glory in Christ. Will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him belongs the power forever. Amen? Amen. And, and what did Peter, did he, did he sign off again? And then he's like, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> I don't know. Verse 12. Through... Silvanus, Silvanus, I don't know really, you know, Greek or anyway, whom I know to be a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly in order to encourage you and testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. So what he's talking about through Silvanus, that just means by him. Uh, there's a couple of ways that that could mean, a couple of things that that could mean. A lot of these old guys, when they were writing the letters, uh, <laughs> they might not have been such good writers. And so they would have someone write it for them. And isn't that cool? So Peter would actually dictate the letter to Sylvanus. Sylvanus would write it down. And he's saying, okay, Sylvanus, let's say, through you, whom I know to be a faithful brother, I have written to these people. So anyway... He's just letting them know that maybe he didn't write it with his own hand. Or, I mean, that was like a secretary. Uh, I can't remember. A manuis. Uh, it has a name. This is a, a very common thing. It's called an amanuesis or a manuesis or something like that when someone gets someone to write a letter for them. Or it could be very well that Sylvanus delivered the letter. Um, Sylvanus shows up at church. I got a letter for you. And Peter is saying it's through Savannah, so he's just giving credit or credibility to the man that delivered the letter. He said, yeah, through the guy that gave you the letter, yeah, that's who I've written through. Anyway, they didn't have email and text and certified sign here, UPS. They didn't have all that, so there was a lot of, of, uh, of uh, other ways of communicating. Now, the cool part is, verse 13, if you've been paying attention in Revelation, uh, verse 13, the church in Babylon, chosen together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a love. Oh, I stop. So the church in Babylon, Babylon's uh, not in this time. Babylon was way in the back, way in history. Babylon got wiped out. They wiped out. But if you're looking at Revelations, Babylon is what they called the Roman Empire. Babylon was... We'll just go read Revelations. You should have been paying attention every Wednesday night. We have talked all about Babylon. Babylon is this great city, this great world system that is oppressive, that is, uh, well, that was called a harlot last night or the week before, that uh, woos people away, 
it's a deductive, it's uh, the mark of the beast, it's uh, you can't buy or trade in this place, it's rich, it's, this is Babylon. And that's what he's calling Rome, because in, when he's writing the letter, it's the Roman Empire that is the Babylon. And some people think Revelations is talking about Rome, I think it's talking about a future world system, but anyway. It's funny how Peter uses the word Babylon, and we've been talking about Babylon. The church in Babylon. Uh, not the church in Madisonville, but the church in this crazy world, the church of the of uh, the nickname of Rome, the, the church that is in this terrible place, chosen together with you, greets you. And that should be encouraging also. And so does Mark. <laughs> My son, it's not Peter's kid, but whenever uh, one man taught another man, discipled him, brought him up, taught him, raised him, whatever he called him, his son. Just means that Mark uh, was uh, following Peter and learning from Peter. And this very well could be Mark that wrote the Mark's Gospel. Uh, could be John Mark. So anyway, greet one another with a loving kiss. Verse 14, next Sunday I expect to see everyone kissing everyone because Peter commands it, right? Anybody out there watching? Greet one another with a loving kiss. No, don't do that. Uh, we have taken the loving kiss, and, and as Baptists, we call it the right hand of fellowship, if you haven't figured that out. Extend a, a right hand of fellowship. Don't go up and kiss it on, folks. And then peace to all you who are in Christ. So, we made it through 1 Peter. It was pretty good. Peter's a preacher. Remember, it's hard to get very far in old Peter because he is a preacher. But, so what does it mean today? Well, the first part about elders. Hey, uh, check your elders and, and see if they are caring for God's flock. If they're exercising oversight. Are they just doing it as a duty? Are they following God's direction? Are they profiting off of it? Do they lord it over those who entrusted you? These are the, the, the characteristics of an elder. Um, in, in our church, uh, we have three elders, and, and me, we have uh, Mr. Hammett, Tim Edwards, and uh, Mr. Robinson. So those are your three. So, hey, watch them. <laughs> but be examples to the flock. And then it says in the same way, you are younger, be subject to the elders. And all of you Work in humility. So, before I close, let me talk about church government. So, it's talking about church government. Okay. In New Testament, uh, New Testament churches was ruled by elders and deacons served. Elders led the churches. There was the pastor and the elders. They taught. They preached. They led the church. They led the ministries. And then along came deacons. This came in later in Acts. Um, the, the reason deacons came was there was a bunch of uh, ladies, uh, older ladies, that weren't getting served. And and so the, the, the elders and the preachers were like, look, y'all pick somebody out of the crowd, not out of the crowd, but from among you that can serve so we can go back and preaching and leading the church. That's what the text says. There's no black, it's all black and white. And that's what they did. They picked some people from among themselves to serve. Those are deacons. The word deacon means to serve. Okay. So deacons are in charge of specific ministries. And there was the deacons of, of helping the widows. There could be the deacon of helping the children. There could be the deacon of helping the... It's just a ministry and they serve in a ministry capacity. Elders provide oversight and pastoral leadership and spiritual leadership for the church. Deacons run the ministries. It's pretty simple. Now, in our world times, we have all forms of church government, okay? We've got elder rule. We've got presbyter rule. We've got deacon boards. We've got council-led. We've got, I don't know, There's uh, we've even got bishops and popes and stuff on the other side. So we've got all these different forms of church government. Well, let me tell you a hint. You can have the best church government system. You can have the, the United States Constitution. You know how great that is. You could have the greatest constitution in a church. You could 
have God written it himself. <laughs> okay? But without a people that humble themselves, without a, a people that follow God, it doesn't matter how great your document and your constitution is, it will fail. It will not work. Kind of sounds like our nation today, does it not? You can have the best church government. You can say, I can have all the bylaws. I can have a binder this thick with all the laws of all of our church and how everybody's supposed to do this. And you can't paint this wall unless you ask four committees. You can have, you can have everything spelled out. But without a people with a good heart that follow God, it means nothing. They will still fight. They will still bicker. They will still be divisive. Now, let's go to the other spectrum. You can have a church with no constitution written down. You can have that binder and throw it in the trash. You can have a pastor and a congregation with no laws, no bylaws, no nothing. And if they have a great heart, and if they humble themselves, and they follow God, and they follow leadership, have the best church in the world. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So what is it really about? It's about humbling yourself and following God's direction and those who are appointed over you. It is simple. It is not about bylaws and government and who does what. I'm sorry, churches, when you put all your faith in your bylaws, you've lost your faith in Christ. Do churches need a little set of rules? Absolutely. But keep a minimum and trust God in what you do and not put all your faith and let your bylaws dictate what happens. So, that's the message this morning, right? That's the message of 1 Peter chapter 5, elders... Rule the church like you're supposed to. People, humble yourself like you're supposed to. Because God opposes the proud. Anyway, so as we go about our day, I probably am way over time, but as we go about our day, remember to humble yourself. Be sober and alert because the devil is roaming like a lion. Roaring like a lion. And he's on the prowl. And he wants to destroy anything he can. Including you, your family, and our church. That's his job. That's what he wants to do. Resist him. Be strong in your faith. Because verse 11, to him, God, belongs the power forever. Amen? Let's pray, church. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this word. Lord, help us uh, follow you today. Humble us, Lord. Do not let us walk with a with a proud heart or a proud thinking or that we are something. And, and help help us walk with humility. Help us uh, follow the leadership that you've given us. Help us follow you and your leadership. Help us not trust some documents or church government, but look to you and follow you and your will. Build our help. Build our relationship to you. Lord, we thank you for the, the leadership that you've given us in our church. We, we ask that you continue to guide us as, as we lead the church and in this time of trouble and not knowing which direction to go, but we will look to you and not our own thoughts and that you will give us those directions, even if it means to wait. Lord, help us be sober and help us be vigilant in watching out for, for the devil and all the things that he tries to put in it. And help us, if we see it, stomp it out or, or turn away or flee or, or resist him. Lord, help us have that knowledge of Scripture to resist him like you did in the desert when he tempted you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have all the power and you have all the grace and that one day you will restore us. We thank you so much. Lord, if we are the church in this Babylon today, help us stay true to you and not be turned away or persuaded to follow something else. And help us be counted as the saints as you do the others. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll have a good weekend. We will see you Sunday morning. Hey, deer season's already over. You're going to kill your deers. Uh... Put on a mask, 
lather up with hand sanitizer, whatever you need to do, right? We'll see you Sunday, and um, have a good week. Bye.